Well, good morning. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word and that we can share these things on YouTube and others can watch them at their convenience. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can be with each person studying these things, that you can Help us to search the scriptures according to the plan that God has given through his word uh, to William Miller and to us in this last days of Earth's history. Help us, Lord, to see things clearly and to apply things correctly. Be with us in our personal struggles and our walk with you, that we may reflect your character in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So, um, good morning again. We have, we have the line here in front of us, as you can see, where we have laid out um, uh, the three plus the fourth of these kings. So three shall yet stand up in Persia, and we've addressed uh, some of these problems. So yesterday we addressed some of the the problems that we have to unravel. And uh, that is, we have a count of the three and then the fourth, but we have different counts. So we, we went back to when or how we got into this application in the first place, how we took Daniel 11 and made this prediction that Trump would be Xerxes. And my understanding of it is that it came from the first seven kings of Persia. So we, I mean, this would go back to 2014, uh, where Jeff is going to see the last seven kings of Judah. And he's going to see that in connection with the four seven times. So that is going to be, well, I guess it's 2013 that, that he does that. Because uh, he presents that in uh, in Alberta, at the same time I present the four seven times, um, the start of those periods uh, with the different uh, kings: Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And Jeff does the same thing at that camp meeting. He presents basically the same thing that I'm presenting, just from a different perspective. So we have the the last seven kings of Judah, and then. We examined the first seven kings of Judah, um, and I think even looked at the last seven kings of Israel. And then around uh, 2015, um, the School of the Prophets were, were studying um, like stories like Esther. So I know that that was uh, studied in 2015. I know at the camp meeting in the fall that had created some uh, division people left the camp meeting because uh, Jeff was uh, making an application that Esther was good and Vashti was bad. And they thought, well, Esther was morally bad and Vashti was morally good. But Jeff said, you don't have to line up the morality of the line. And, and so there was that disagreement. So I know that they were studying Esther in 2015. And in that process, they began studying uh, the first seven kings of Persia. And I know I was studying that chronology sort of parallel to what they were doing with one eye on what they were doing. But I was doing a sort of an independent study. And um, so I was sorting out the Babylonian captivity, uh, all the chronology of that. And so when we got to 2016, uh, I guess January 9th, 2016, that that was presented at Lambert Church. Stephen says that uh, um, uh, we have these these kings. This is Daniel 11 verses, you know, one to three, and 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 that's when that happened. So it, it was in connection with the understanding of the last seven or the first seven kings of Persia. And so we had a count. When we count the kings of Persia, we don't count 
a Darius the Mede, right? Because he's not Persian, he's a Mede, right? And then when we line that up with the presidents of the United States, uh, if we're going to count, do the count, because Reagan lines up with Darius, Reagan is zero, and George Bush the first is the first king. But when we're dealing with this count, we have a count where number one is, is Cambyses, which lines up with Clinton. So we have these different sort of counts. Um, here, I'll just quickly grab this here. Um, so I know I looked at one of these charts. I think it was this one here. So you can see we have a count, a Dries the Mead and Reagan are not counted in this, the, the kings of Persia. And Bush the first is going to be number one. And then Clinton, of course, is number two. But in this, this other count, Clinton is one, Bush is two, Bush two is two, Obama is three, and then Trump is the fourth, right? Because Cambyses is the first, False Smyrtis is the second, Darius is um, the third, and then Xerxes is the fourth. That's far richer than them all. And that stirs up all against the realm of Grecia. So we can see here that if we were to follow this line of thinking, Biden would be the sixth in this line at the bottom. But we know um, that we had an application uh, made by, by Colin. And again, this is not like an attack on Colin's things. These are just things that have to be sorted out. That we have Ronald Reagan as number one in this list. So when we have the five are fallen in this list, um, you're gonna have Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George Bush uh, Jr., and then Barack Obama as the fifth. Donald Trump would be the one that is, and then Joe Biden is the one that's yet to come, and then the eighth is of the seven, that's gonna be Donald Trump's resurrection. Right. So this is this is how Colin had laid this out. So since this is his diagram, we would have to accept that this is the view that he had and still has. <clears throat> so. Um, so when we so when we look at this count, the main thing here is that this is a different count. And, and the question is, how do we account? for the five are fallen. Now this, this is a major issue in Revelation 17. So we're gonna go there um, and address this issue in Revelation 17 itself. Now we're, get, we're, we're just doing this preliminary, obviously we're gonna come back to Revelation 17 and 12 and 13 and, and so forth later on, but just as far as this count is concerned, so the application that this movement has had uh, for a long time is that when we get to uh, this riddle, um, here's the mind that has wisdom, Revelation 17, verse 9. Uh, the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth in to perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, we have taken the position because we know John is carried to 1798. And then there's this explanation given. And the way that we have done it is we say, we say that he's at 1798. And so that, the, that this is, we have to do the count from 1798. That is, we say five are fallen. That's gonna be 
Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, because the papacy falls. The one that is, is the United States, right? And, and we also take other prophecies. We talk about um, the days of one king. That's going to be the 70 years, the days of one king. That's going to be the United States, right? So that's the one that is. And the other is not yet come. So that would be the UN. And then we take the application, but he must continue a short space. Um, now, if, if in our application that we have made in this movement, that would be the short space is going to be uh, this Sunday law, this initial Sunday law where the UN supports it. But then um, the eighth is going to be the papacy placed upon the throne of the world, the Antichrist. You know, there's different ways in which we would sort of describe that. But uh, does that make sense of that? That is that an accurate description of what this movement has taught. It seems to be, yeah. Uh... Okay. Now, when we look at the pioneers' view of this, they take the position that the explanation that's given to, even though John is carried to 1798, he's going to see something in the future, that the explanation is given from the time in which he is. So they take the position that the five that are fallen are forms of Roman government, uh, one of which includes republicanism, the republican form of government. The one that is, is um, the emperors, right? So that's imperial Rome. And then the one that's yet to come is papal Rome, so the papal form of government. And the way that Joseph Bates understands this is that the eighth, he goes back to Revelation 13. So he say, sees here uh, this papacy, this composite beast, right, has all these characteristics. And that the second beast, this is the United States, he then equates with the eighth. So he says that the eighth is the Republican form of government. And that what we see here, these, this two-horned beast has this Protestant Republican characteristic. And so it's going to be the United States with the Sunday law at the end of the world that is being described as the eighth. That is, the eighth itself is the Sunday law. That is, it's the second beast with the mark of the beast and all those things. So that, that's the way that Joseph Bates understands it. So his is an expansion of the pioneer view, is that that view was held before 1844 by Miller and his associates. So, so as they're developing this understanding, especially after 1850, this is how Joseph Bates comes to understand this. Now, this view isn't really predominant that I can see in uh, Adventism, even at that time. Um, I don't think it's even generally addressed. That is, the riddle is, is sort of set aside for the most part. That is, there isn't many. Uh, one is there's a disagreements on how to interpret Revelation 17 in early Adventist history. So it's, it's not something that there's universal agreement upon. And so it's not something that's promoted or, you know, written about in, in any sort of detail that I can find, um, in looking, trying to understand that from the pioneers writings or from the early Adventist church writings. So it's just something that's kind of set aside. And we can see even throughout Adventism, you know, my experience as a Seventh day Adventist is there was other interpretations. Uh, Roy Allen Anderson's interpretation seems to be the predominant one that has pervaded conservative Adventism. Um, but so anyway, if we're going to go to this numbering, because that's really what we're looking at here, if we're going to try to make an application 
of the five are fallen and we're going to attach it to these presidents of the United States, we have to know where we're going to count from. So if we count from Reagan, it's obviously a different count than counting the kings of Persia. Right? Because if Reagan's number one, then how do we account for Reagan to be number one? We would, we would say, well, that's from the time of the end. But, you know, we normally put the time of the end as where we have um, the five are fallen. You understand what I'm saying there? Right. So we go to 1798. That's the time of the end. We don't we don't say, well, the time of the end is where we start the count. So any thoughts on this, this problem? I know Stephen has some thoughts on it because he, he had before we started recording some thoughts on it. So how do we get the interpretation, the five are fallen, that we're going to get um, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and that Trump is the one that is? How would we get to Collins' count? What would be the the way that we would do that? Yeah, so I had suggested that Jeff was like John in AD 100. Okay. And John was taken into the wilderness and um, sort of at the end of the wilderness where he sees the, the woman drunk. Yeah. And then the also, um, what else is it? The strong one with the blood of the saints. And then she has daughters as well. So this is taking us to the end of the 1260. Mm -hmm. 1260 being the wilderness. So he's taken 1798. And I had uh, suggested in a presentation I thought from about maybe a year or so ago that uh, Jeff and uh, it was like John when he's given this here presentation on January the 9th, 2016. Okay. And he's he's like projecting in the future when the one is. So he's sort of saying he, he's, his mindset's pointing to the 20th of January, 2017, when there'll be another election. Mm -hmm. uh, well, sort of the another president that results from the election and he mm -hmm. would begin to reign them. So in a sense John Jeff was then sort of looking forward to that time as John was looking to the seventeen ninety eight. And uh, so the one that one one is then would be in the United States for John and the one is would be the Trump uh for Jeff. Right. So he's looking to the end of that period. Now of course, the pioneers don't take that position. They take the position that John is brought to 1798, but that the explanation is given in the context of where John is. So that would, that would be, um, that, that wouldn't really line up if we're going to take how the pioneers understood it. Now, I've taken the position that when we've done this application, that is, when we've looked at Babylon, Egypt, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, etc., that the one that is is the United States, the one that's to come is the UN. That I don't think that that's the application or that's the interpretation of the prophecy in its primary sense. That is, it's an application. That I, I agree with the pioneers that their view is correct. And, and we're going to have to look at that in more detail because there are some problems when we uh, deal with the 10, right? So if we go back and we look at um, uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, and we have these beasts 
that are similar but different. That is, they have some of the same characteristics. They have seven heads. <coughs> but there's a difference between the crowns and the horns and how those operate. So they have seven heads and ten horns. But they're not the same period of time. That is, Revelation 12 is a different period of time. The vision is is bringing us to a different period of time. So we would say that the 12, it's going to bring us to uh, that period from the time of Christ up to the beginning of the 1260. Revelation 13 is going to bring us to the end of the 1260 and the rise of the United States. And Revelation 17 uh, brings us from uh, the rise of the United States in 1798 all the way up until the second coming. So it's just kind of a, a general way, way, way in which I understand these things because they're different periods of time. Uh, you know, the crowns are going to be on the heads in Revelation 12. The crowns are going to be on the horns in Revelation 13. And there's going to be no crowns, no kingdom. There's no kings, so to speak in Revelation 17. And this is going to be, of course, that's why we would have uh, the United Nations there with these 10 that have received no kingdom as of yet. So, and, and then with, um, uh, so with this other principle, we have to examine it a little bit. Do we have the pioneers view uh, where they're saying just because Daniel's brought to 1798, we wouldn't, or not Daniel, John is brought to 1798. We wouldn't, we wouldn't take the explanation of the riddle as from the perspective of 1798, but we would take the explanation of the riddle or the riddle itself being given, um, as from John's perspective in the first century AD, right? Cause that's the pioneer view. And, is this um, does this make sense what the pioneers say about that, or would we have to say that they were wrong about how to look at the explanation, and what other examples would we have? I think from their perspective, they were making a best attempt to understand that prophecy. Okay. They were before 1945. They didn't want to have any idea of the United States, United Nations coming up and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that would be my understanding that as an application to their day as they're understanding it. Okay, so but, a, but that's not the question. The question is the principle that they laid out that the explanation is given in the context of the prophet. They're saying they're not just saying there. They're saying always that you have a a prophet brought to a history, but when the explanation is given, it's given from the perspective of the time the prophet is actually living, not from where he's brought to in vision. That that's what they're saying. And the question is, is this correct? Can we have other examples where we would say, yes, they had good reason to make that claim? That, that's what I'm asking. Because I think there's an application to be made that this movement has done. So I would agree with the Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, United States, United Nations, and then the papacy. I would, I would accept that interpretation, that line. But we need to recognize it's an application. But if we go back to this principle, it does it bear out the way that that they interpret this as far as are they following consistent principles? Can we find other examples where a prophet is brought to a future date, but when the explanation is given to him, it's going to be from the context of the time that he's living, not the time that he's brought to? That that's the question. Well, I, I would have to think you'd have to sort of parallel it with Daniel chapter eight. Yes, right. So that's where we're going. Daniel chapter eight. 
Okay, so Daniel's being brought to 457 BC, right? Yes. Okay, because he's brought to Shushan the palace, and that's in Persia. And he's in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So he's 19 years uh, before the fall of Babylon. Right? <clears throat> that's that's where he is at the time. But he's brought to, you know, 80 years after the fall of Babylon. So he's brought way into the future, to 457 B.C., just like John is in Revelation, brought to 1798. Okay. So he's, he's going to see, uh, first, he's going to see um, Medo-Persia, right, and its conquering. So he's going to be brought into that history where Medo-Persia is expanding its kingdom. And then he's going to uh, see this goat. So that's even going to be after 457, right? So he's going to see the goat coming and attacking uh, the ram, right? And then he, he's going to see all these things in the future. But where is he in this interpretation so he's it says here um let me see so he's going to be brought you know all through this history but he's he's in vision he's in shushan the palace so in vision he's in 457 bc right or at least he's in the persian period he's not in the babylonian period in vision and then he's going to be shown this vision of all these things that are going to happen to Persia, right? So Persia is going to fall, and it's going to fall to Greece, and then Greece is going to fall because it's going to be divided into these four, and then you're going to have this little horn power that's going to uh, – that it's going to – and we see here in the this, this horn that comes up, this horn is both pagan and papal Rome, right? So when he magnified himself even to the prince of the host – and from him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. This is addressing pagan Rome. But a host was given against the daily by reason of transgression. And, and we're going to see here that this is going to be the papacy, right? So the papacy comes into play. So both pagan and papal Rome are tied together here. So then we're going to have the explanation by the angel. How long should be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to be give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And then he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So when you deal with this 2,300 days, so we have, we have 2,300 days from where? From 457. Okay, so from 457. And we know that when it talks about the daily being taken away and the transgression of desolation being set up, that you're not going to count from that time, right? You're not going to count from the time that the daily is taken away and the transgression of desolation is set up, 2,300 days. So, so we're in the period of... Uh, this vision that's going to be talked about. So in Daniel 8.15, um, well, let's let's go to 8.13. So in 8.13, like we're going to have two different visions that are going to be talked about, right, in Daniel chapter 8. You're going to have the Mara and you're going to have the Chazon. So when it came to pass, I even, I, Daniel, well, let's go back to verse 13 first. Okay. Then I heard one saint speaking unto, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which is Palmoni, how long shall be the vision? So that vision there is going to be the chazon, right? So this vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation is the 2520 
for northern Israel. Right? These are the two 1260s. Do we agree with that? All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it is primarily that. Now, we know that there's another 2520, which is is included in that. That is the 2520 that Miller saw is connected to the 2520 of northern Israel. Now, Miller didn't know that. He knew about the 2520 for northern Israel, but he focused on the 2520 for Judah, right? That, that's what he, he's going to look at. He's going to look at Manasseh's captivity, 677 to 1843 or 1844, right? So that's that's how Miller understood it. So, so we're in the middle of this uh, 2520. We're in the period of the 2520 when this explanation is given. So, so how long shall be the vision concerning the daily that's paganism and the transgression of desolation, papalism to be, give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Now, we know that the treading down is a work that's done by the papacy, right? Because the scattering work is done by paganism. Paganism is going to scatter the power of the holy people. It does the work of scattering. The papacy does the work of treading underfoot. So, so here, the, the focus, when it says the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot, that's the transgression of desolation. That's the 1260 from uh, 538 to 1798, right? We agree with that? Yes. Okay. And then the answer is unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now that's going to bring us not to the end of the 2520 for, for northern Israel. That's going to bring us to the end of the 2520 for Judah. Right? So the 2300 days brings us 45 to 46 years, depending, well, I guess we'd say 46 years, past the end of the abomination of desolation. So I think that's the best way to understand these two verses. Now, um, so the vision that's being talked about there is the chazon. Then in verse 15, it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision. So here, it's still going to be the chazon, right? It's So that when he says he saw the vision, he's seeing the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation. That's what he sees. And, and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Now that word appearance is the word Mara, right? We got a Mara, right? That's the, the vision, that's gonna be the vision of the evenings and the mornings. So then it says, I heard a man's voice between the banks of you, of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the Mara. Okay? Correct. Okay, so, so now we have this other vision introduced, and this vision is, of course, going to be the vision of the evenings and mornings. That is, uh, so when he says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We're going to know that, the, and it's going to tell us later, that the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told, is true. So that vision of the evenings and mornings is the Mara, not the Chazon. 
But these two are interconnected. Now, the way that Jeff looked at it is we had um, the panoramic vision and the snapshot vision. And I'm not sure if I like that. I don't think that's the best way to look at it, but that's just my opinion. Um, I just think that if we can distinguish between uh, the 2520 for Northern Israel as being primarily the Kazone, the two desolating powers, and then we look at the 2300 days, which ends at the same time of the 2520 for Judah, the 2520 for Judah is going to address the cleansing of the sanctuary because it's going to end on the 10th day of the seventh month along with the 2300 days. So they're going to end together. But I don't, I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we can say that the Kazon is the entire prophetic mirror. The Kazon is a part of it. Right? So the, the 2520 prophetic mirror has within it the Chazon, but it also has the 2300 days, which is connected with the 2520 of Miller. Now, Miller tried to um, take this, uh, this period of, of the des two desolating powers, beginning it with... Um, He, he's going to not start at 723. He's going to start at 677, right? So when he deals with that uh, in Daniel 12, verse 7, where it talks about the scattering of the power of the holy people, he's going to take that first 1260. He's going to take that 45 years off, or 40, I guess it'd be 46 years off the beginning, and he's going to put it at the end, right? So he's going to put after 1798, after the papacy, you're going to then have the rest of that 1260 being finished from 1798 to 1843. I don't know if people need to look at that, but we've looked at that before. That's how Miller understood it. So he, he takes the 1260, he takes the 45 years off, so he, he doesn't quite get it right, but he's, he's going to take, um, uh, 1260 minus 45. And so he's going to have 1215 years of the time, times and a half from 677 to 538. And then from 538, he's going to take the papacy to 1798. And then he's going to put the 45 years on the end again to bring us to 1843. Is anybody unclear about what I'm talking about, what Miller did. I know this is, is sort of getting, but we need to understand this in order to answer this question properly. I think you need to go back over this a little bit. Okay, so... Um, See if I can find this. It looks like I found it. Okay. So this is William Miller. This is Dissertations on the True Inheritance of the Saints. And... You want to put that up on the screen? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I just got to get this set up. Okay, so he says, so he's talking about Manasseh's captivity, 677. He says, if this is the time when the kings of the earth began to rule over Zion, to scatter the power of the holy people for a time, times and a half, so he's referring to Daniel 12, verse 7, or 1260 years, when will it end? I answer, when all these things shall be finished. First, the kings exercise their authority 677 years before Christ and 538 years after Christ, which 677 added to 538 makes up 215 years only, which did not accomplish the scattering of the holy people, nor the treading underfoot of the court 42 months, or the 1260 years. 
This is the reason why John was not to measure, because it would not be fulfilled until mystical Babylon should wear out the saints and change times and laws, a time, times, and a half. So he's saying we have to have first this period of 1260 years of the papacy, this time, times, and a half of the papacy. For God hath put into the hearts of these kings to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom unto the mystery of Babylon or papal Rome until the 1260 years of mystical Babylon should be fulfilled, which 1260 years added to 538 when the kings became of one mind, right? So that's going to carry us down to the year 1798 when the kings again took their power and will now accomplish the scattering of the holy people by reigning from 1798 to 1843, which is 45 years add which to 1215, which the kings had reigned before mystical Babylon obtained the power. And we have 1260 years of the king's reign, scattering the holy people, treading underfoot the sanctuary and the host. Okay, so this is the view of Miller. So Miller doesn't, um, he doesn't take this 1260 starting at 723 BC to 538. He's going to start the 1260 of the scattering of the power of the holy people at 677. And then the 45 years that are left over, he's going to put from 1798 to 1843. Is that clear now? Yes. Okay. So, so when we go back to this, um, we can understand that where Miller is coming from, because he's seen that there is these, and, and he doesn't understand it the way we do, because I don't know if he, he recognizes the two different words vision here, but he recognizes that there is this period that's uh, pagan and papal, uh, you know, paganism and papalism, the two desolating powers. And when he looks at the question, he's not going to start from when the papacy rises. Because if you were to take the idea that the daily is Christ's heavenly ministry, and you're saying that, that that's going to be taken away by papal Rome, well, then you would have to start the 1260 count from 538 or 508 or something like that, right? That is, Miller would never have come to the conclusion that the 2300 days began in 457 BC if he had taken the new view of the daily. That's yeah. true. Throw yeah. it so if you, throw this throw yeah, it doesn't. It wouldn't make any sense, right? So, so he's going to take this view um, that that this is starting at some earlier point, and that earlier point is going to be 457 BC. Now, now, why is what is there in Daniel chapter eight that would tell us that it's starting in the Persian period? I mean. Because that's where he's going to start it. He's going to start it in the Persian period. So we know that, that Daniel's in the time of Babylon, right? He's not in the time of Persia. Uh, but he's going to be brought to the time of Persia to start the 2300 days. So... How would we understand this? Because if we're going to count the 2300 days, we're not going to count them from the time of Babylon, right? We can't count them from the time of Babylon. Yeah. So, so is this agreeing with the pioneers understanding where they did when they address John, or is this disagreeing with the pioneers understanding? Because, because they're going to start this in the Persian period, the 2300 days, even though Daniel's in the Babylonian period. So he's not going to start the 2300 days from where he is. He's going to start the 2300 days from 
where he was brought to. So we disagree with the pioneers way of interpreting uh, Revelation 17, or would it be inconsistent with it? Now, let's let's look at um, verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the chazon, the vision. Now, does the chazon end at the time of the end? Time in the end, 1798. Right. See, so you can see that this is consistent with the idea that the time of the end is 1798. Yeah. Okay. Um. So how does this help us? So we we have. So let's let's just review this a little bit. Daniel's in Babylon, 19 years before the fall of Babylon. He has a vision where he's brought to Shushan, the palace, to Persia, the city of Shusha, the capital of Persia. And um, and so that means he's brought to the time, not even of the Medes, right? Because in the time in which he's living, it's the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And Shushan, the palace, is not the capital, right? So he wouldn't be brought to Shushan, the palace, in his time. He has to be brought to Shushan the palace in the future, right? And that's why the vision starts with the ram, right? It doesn't start with Babylon. Now, some people say, well, that's because Babylon's coming to an end and, and so forth. But the reality is he's in Shushan the palace. He's not in vision, he is. So he's brought in vision to something in the future. That's very similar to John being brought to 1798, to the wilderness. Because John's not in the wilderness in the first century AD. That period hasn't even begun. It's, you know, uh, nearly 500 years until the wilderness begins. Right? He's in 97 AD or 96. And... You know, it's not going to be till 538, so it's like 450 years or something. Then he will would be in the wilderness. But even then, he's brought to the end of the wilderness. So Daniel is brought to the beginning of the 2300 days, or at least to the Persian period, right? Right. He's he's so he's not in vision. He's in the time of Persia. He's not in the time in which he is. So he's brought to the future. Now. Daniel, of course, when he writes this, he's going to be writing it at the end of his life. Right? He's, he's writing out this vision, not when it happens. And we can tell that, you know, by how the book of Daniel is written, that he's writing this later on in his life. Not, not. I mean, he might have recorded some of this at the time, but he's putting it together as a book at the end of his life. He's putting together all these visions that he had. Um, but he would understand, he might not have understood where he was when he had the vision. That is, when he had the vision, he may not have known that he was at Chushan in the palace, right? But later, he would recognize this. I mean, maybe as, um, you know, as, uh, you know, part of the Babylonian government, Maybe he did travel to these places. But my understanding is that Shushan in the palace didn't exist until the time of Darius. Darius the Persian, that he's the one who built this palace in Shushan. So to talk about Shushan in the palace, um, that would be a place that didn't exist, um, at least in its completeness, uh, in Daniel's lifetime. But he would have at least recognized uh, that he was in Shushan. So, so there's some some uncertainty. Some people say that Shushan in the palace was was still built, would have existed in the time of Cyrus, 
and maybe time to dry us the meat, it's possible. But but anyway, I think he's brought to 457. And maybe God reveals him to him in vision where he is. So maybe initially he doesn't know, but God tells him this, where he is, Shushan in the palace. Okay. So he's in the prominent province of Elam. And he's by the banks of the river of the Uli. Okay, so that's where he is in vision. Now he's going to see things that are going to happen after 457. He's going to see Greece, Alexander, right? He's going to see um, the division of the kingdom. All those things that happen in Daniel chapter 11 are here in, in sort of a, uh, a preview of what's going to happen, right? The four horns, then the two horns, uh, um, right? So then, so you're going to have the four horns, and then you're going to have this little horn. So you're going to have the papacy rise out of, but it's not just the papacy; it's going to be Rome as well, right? So the so basically Rome, both pagan and papal, are going to be represented by this little horn. Right. And then he's going to be uh, seeing the period where papal Rome rises. That it is that we're going to see the taking away of the daily pagan Rome and the, it being replaced by papal Rome. So we're going to see all of these things in vision, all of that history. So we're going to be given to the start of the 1260 for papal Rome, but it's going to be part of the chazon, right? This is these two desolating powers. So when it talks about the chazon, I, Daniel, had seen the vision. What he saw was the two 1260s, daily and the transgression of desolation. But then he's going to hear when, when there was this question regarding the 2,300 days, this is going to be where he stood before the appearance of the man or a vision of the man, which is the mare. So then he's going to be uh, to be asked to understand this vision. And this vision is the 2300 days. So now we have the explanation. Right. So he says, so I came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, fell upon my face, and he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the chazon. So those two, the daily and the transgression of desolation, they end in 1798. And then now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So what's the last end of the indignation? What's the last end of the indignation? What is that referring to? 1844. Okay, what would you, so why would you say that that's the last end of the indignation? The last 2520. Okay, so that's how we would interpret it. But I would say that that's wrong. And I'll give you my explanation and you can, we can discuss it. So what's the first end of the indignation? What is the indignation in the first place? The uh, pagan abomination. Okay, so the first end is the pagan. That's the daily. The last end is papalism. So when he says the last end of the indignation, I take that as being 1798. But then he says, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. So what is that word time appointed in Hebrew?
Isn't that Moed? Yeah, that's Moed. So that's going to be 1844. So what I understand this verse to be saying is that the last end of the indignation is 1798. For the time appointed, the end shall be as 1844. That this is referring to that period of 46 years from 1798 to October 22nd, 1844. That's how I interpret this. So to say, I will make the uh, know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, that's going to be from 1798 to the time appointed. Because the time appointed, Moed refers to the feast, and it would refer to an appointed time such as the Day of Atonement. So any thoughts on that? Does that make sense, how I'm interpreting this? At this point, it seems to line up. Okay. So, so Daniel is being given an explanation of the end of the 2300 days and the end of the Kazon. These two things, the Kazon and the Mare, he's being shown where they end. So now the, um, now he's going to have the explanation. The, about this vision of the Chazon, right? The ram which thou sawest having the horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So he's going to see the kings of Media, Persia. Now, in this explanation, is he in the time of Persia? Is he in 457 BC or is he in Babylon in this explanation? Is he being shown something that's going to happen from his perspective? Because this would be the key here. So he's, he's been given this explanation. It seems to me that the pioneers are correct. Because he's in Babylon. What he's going to now have explained to him is what's going to happen. Because the kings of Media and Persia are going to expand their kingdom. They're going to conquer Babylon. Babylon's not mentioned here, but the horns of the kings of Media and Persia means this explanation is not from, from the point of 457 BC. That is, he's not in 457 BC when he's having this explanation given to him of the Kazone. He's in the middle of that Kazone. He's in the time of Babylon. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. So he's going to be shown stuff in the future, but he's being shown it from the point of where he is in his time, not where he's brought to in vision. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And then he's going to have all this explanation, right? Um, and then... Uh, let me see here. So it's going to talk here about uh, the fierce king of the uh, king of fierce countenance, understanding dark net sentences. That brings us to Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 50 and 51. And then his power shall be mighty, not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, shall pro prosper in practice, shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Again, this is pagan Rome persecuting from that period from 34 AD to 538. And through his policy, he shall also cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken without hand. Again, who stands up against the prince of princes? That's going to be pagan Rome, right? So, so he's going to be brought to this period about the pagan powers. And then as he goes on, he's going to be given more explanation in uh, chapter 10, 11, 12. And then he, he goes back, the vision of the evening and the morning, which was true. That's the 2300 days, um, which was told is true. Therefore, wherefore shut up the vision for it shall be for many days. 
And and then he says, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. I was astonished at the vision, that's the Mara, but none understood it. Right, which is why in Daniel chapter 9, he's going to want to understand the end of the 70 weeks, or the, or the 70 years, pardon me. Right, he's going to be given the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And then chapter 10, he's going to want to know about the decree. All those things happen. So how do we see this? Do you guys see it the way I see it? Or that Daniel is given the explanation from the time that he's in? Or is he given the explanation of the time to where he's brought? Well, if you look at uh, Daniel 8, verse 14, it mentions 2,300 days is the answer. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, it mentions, then it mentions the next verse. After he had seen the vision, he's by the banks of the Uli in verse 16. Yeah. So that, that indicates after he had seen that vision, he's still in Media Persia. He's still by the banks of the Uli. Okay, so in, in verse 16, you're saying he's still in vision by the banks of the Uli, right? Which I would agree. So he's still in vision in this, this in, interpretation. Well, but I'm just saying, it, when, no, in verse 15, you, you maybe didn't hear me right. In verse 15, it mentions after he had seen the vision, so the, in a sense, the vision's over. Okay, yeah, in a sense. Yeah. But, he, but he still says he's by the banks of the Uli. Okay. So, so in a so sense, he's, he's still, in a sense, in some way, he's still there in Media Persia in some way. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I understood you said. So, so when he had seen the vision, that vision is the Chazon, right? In, in verse 15. Okay. Right? So that, that's the vision of the two desolating powers. And he wants to know the meaning of that. Right. And so he's still in vision because there stood before me as the appearance of a man. So he's still in vision. And, and that would be true of John as well. Is John still in vision when he's given the explanation? when he's given the riddle and all that, is he still in vision? We would have to say yes, right? He's, he's not. Right, okay. Okay, so so Daniel's still in vision. And so he's still in vision, he's still by the banks of the Uli. And right, and he's gonna hear a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which says, which is gonna be Palmoni saying uh, to Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Right, and the vision here then is the Mara. Right, so you have, uh, so now he wants, um, he wants to know the meaning of the Chazon, but he, the angel Gabriel is going to tell him the meaning of the Mara. Right, so there's these two different visions. And so these, but he's still in vision. So we know where he is in vision. But the question is, is the explanation being given to him from the time in which he lives, just as it was with John? John still is in 1798 in vision in uh, Revelation 17. He's still in the future. But the question is, is the explanation of what he sees from his own time and and can we discern that from where the explanation is given to in Daniel chapter 8 is the explanation being given from his own time even though he's still in vision in the future where is the explanation where do we place the explanation as far as what it's talking about because that's the pioneer's contention about Revelation 17. So 
does that bear out here? So I agree with you, he's still in vision. So he's not, you know, sitting there in Babylon, um, uh, you know, after he was in vision, being given explanation. He's still in vision. And this vision happens by the banks of the Uli. And so the voice comes from between the banks of the Uli <clears throat> that gives the explanation. But can we discern in Daniel 8, verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having horns are the kings of Media and Persia. If it's the kings of Media and Persia, is he being given the explanation of somebody in Babylon who is being told about what's going to come? That's the question. Are Media and Persia still future? Or is this... Is this talking about something that's past? See, I could I could check that. In vision, he's seeing the kings of Media Persia as being present. Okay, but the kings of Media something Persia, future. Right, but the kings of Media and Persia aren't aren't present in four fifty seven. Media doesn't exist in four fifty seven. There's only Persia. Because when Darius the Mede dies, that's the end of Median, the Median kingdom. Right. It becomes okay. the version. Yes. Right. So but, uh, I'm not too sure. No, yeah, I know. Yeah. So but I would I say. Know. It's it's not, yeah, it's it's not it's not really clear cut. No. Right. But but what we can say is that that this would make sense that the kings of Media Persia are still future to Daniel. Right? And and what's being described here is going to be uh um future events to Daniel, but not future events from four fifty seven BC. But I, I would say it's not it's not super clear, right? We, it's it's not as clear cut as as we would need to draw that conclusion that they draw regarding Revelation 17. So it could be taken either way. We can say that, right? I would agree. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, any other examples? that we could look at in Daniel or even in Ezekiel. Do we have things where Ezekiel's taken into the future, but the explanation would be from his perspective? Can we think of any? Well, Ezekiel, he's taken into Jerusalem. Okay, yeah. So in Ezekiel, just... where would you want to go? Uh, for that uh, well, chapter, that's, uh, chapter eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have in Ezekiel, we have again somebody who's taken into vision, right? Just like Daniel and John are. So these, and Ezekiel is, you know, if you want to give it a classification, it would be apocalyptic literature. And uh, one of the things I just want to say about this, just as an aside. So the idea that modern scholarship has is that apocalyptic literature was invented in the second century BC. So the book of Daniel couldn't have been written in uh, the fifth century BC because, um, you know, apocalyptic literature hadn't been created yet. So they want to put it. Now, they don't do that with Ezekiel. And why don't people try to put Ezekiel as being written in the second century BC? Why do they accept that Ezekiel is written by Ezekiel? Ezekiel is quite precise with the dates. <laughs> he's, he's so precise that that knowledge could not have been 
There's nothing about Ezekiel that could make them try to put Ezekiel in the second century. They have to accept that Ezekiel is written by Ezekiel. Even if they try to put editors and stuff later on, they're just there's too much detail that agrees with actual history for it to be something written in the second century. And, and none of it applies. Um, it wouldn't even make sense to have Ezekiel written in the second century from the topics and everything that's being described. It would be it would be a masterpiece of of literature to write something that doesn't have any anachronisms in it. Um, and that uh, isn't even addressing anything in in the second century BC to be written in the second century BC. So it just doesn't have any characteristics, except that it's apocalyptic literature. So that's always a problem with Ezekiel because it is apocalyptic literature, right? So so obviously apoc apocalyptic literature existed in the time of Daniel. So to say that it's apocalyptic literature means that Daniel was written in the second century doesn't make any sense. But anyway, that's just an aside from uh, looking at critical scholarship. So so here, Ezekiel is going to be uh, carried away in vision in verse eight of ch or verse three of chapter eight. And he put forth the form of a hand, took me by the lock of mine head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now, now he is seen in vision, and in some ways a symbolic way, though there may be some literal aspects to it, uh, of what is happening in Jerusalem. Now, this is going to be um, in um, the sixth year, of Jehoiachin's captivity. And we know that Jerusalem's not going to be destroyed until uh, the 11th no, that, 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 That's the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign. Okay, the sixth year, but it's going to be the same. Right, At okay. this point, the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign and the sixth year of the captivity are going to be the same because it's in the fifth month. Where the discrepancy would come is if we uh, were anywhere from the seventh uh, to the twelfth month, the count would be different. But yes, you're right. Correct. You're correct. It's in the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign, which is the sixth year of the captivity. But the, the point I'm making here is that he's been in captivity. This is the sixth year of his captivity, sixth year of Zedekiah's reign. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Okay, so here, anyway, he's in the sixth year, so it's going to be in the eleventh year of Zedekiah's reign that the temple is going to be destroyed, the city is going to be destroyed, and in the ninth year that the siege begins. So this is three years before the siege. And so he's being shown the condition of Jerusalem, the priests and so forth, and um but he's 500 miles away so he's he's not literally brought to jerusalem he's there in visions right um we also have that in chapter uh where is it here chapter three is it okay yeah, he's taken to tel aviv yeah, he's going to be taken Seven to Tel Aviv. Yeah, but not not to, to Tel Aviv in Israel. It's a place in Tel Aviv in in Babylon. But still, um, yeah. So he's going to be taken to the to to them of the captivity in Tel Aviv, that dwell by the river of Kibar. And he sat and remained there, astonished among them seven days. So he has this vision uh, that he's in Tel Aviv for seven days sitting there astonished, okay. So so we can see there's this, this idea that he's being brought in vision, just like Daniel is brought somewhere else. But Daniel's brought to another time. I don't think Ezekiel is brought to another time here, right? Unless you're gonna say that he's brought to 
uh, to see the destruction of Jerusalem. Because in, in chapter 9, uh, we're going to see the men with the slaughtering weapons in their hand, right? So that could be that he's brought to the destruction of Jerusalem. But he's not brought way well, there. Well, they are, in a sense, he's taken to the pose of probation. Well, to our time. You're talking yeah, about. Even, um, yeah, yeah, beyond. Yes. yes. Right. But but we make that as an application. Obviously, here, he would understand this literally as talking about what's going to happen in Jerusalem with with the city being destroyed. But yes, he's brought he's brought to things in the future. And that's that's the main point that that happens here, because remember, Ezekiel is going to in chapter 20, he's going to see the destruction of Jerusalem right in vision. He's going to be prophesying about that. But we know that Ezekiel is actually prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as well, right? So everything that, that Ezekiel is going through, that he's seen in these visions, is going to be addressed not just things in his day, but things that are going to happen in 70 AD, but also at the end of the world. Right. So, so how does this help us with Ezekiel? Can we, uh, because he's going to predict the destruction of Jerusalem in the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. He's he's not going to ex explicitly state that, but he's going to start this count, right? And if we follow that count, um, you know, for instance, if we say, you know, the 37th year of Jehoiachin's captivity, or the 30, well, I guess it'd be the 36th year. That's going to be um, uh, 561. If we keep counting all those things, or if we say 723 is the 25th year of, of the captivity, right? So that's going to be Ezekiel 40. So when we go to Ezekiel 40, in the 25th year of the captivity, that's going to be um, uh, uh, 573 BC, right? And if you keep counting all the years of the captivity, when you get to 70 AD, that's going to be the 666th year of the captivity. Right? And it's an ordinal count. If you do the cardinal count, you still get its 666 years from Jehoiachin's captivity to 70 AD. I hope I'm not confusing you. But... But anyway, the point is Ezekiel is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We can agree with that, right? Even if he's not aware that's what he's doing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so he's in his day, um, and, and these perspective, the perspective that he has, himself personally is that it's being talking about what's happening in Jerusalem at the present time. But we know that we can take this story of Ezekiel 8 and we can place it in the future at the end of time. Right? Yes. And when we do that, are we making an application of this? Or is this the primary interpretation of this prophecy that this is addressing of the Sunday law? Or is that an application of this prophecy? Probably an application. Okay. Yeah, so we make this an application. That is, we take what happened historically that was fulfilled, it was a prophecy of Ezekiel, it was fulfilled literally with literal Israel, right? Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And not only is it just destroyed in his time, it's going to be destroyed after the time of Christ, right, in 70 AD. And 
And you can take this and make an application to 70 AD, and you can connect it prophetically. But we can take this and apply it to our time that we are in. And, and so the explanation that's going to be given to Ezekiel would address his time, right? That's how he would understand it. Do people follow where, where I'm going with this? No. Okay. So when you go to Ezekiel 24, He's been predicting the siege of Jerusalem, right? Correct. It's going to be at the end of a 40-year period and a 390-year period. They're both going to end together. They're going to start with an end, start, both start with in the connection with the prophecy of Josiah, when it's given and when it's fulfilled. So when it's given, it's going to be 390 years to the siege. When it's fulfilled, it's going to be 40 years to the siege. And then when the siege begins in the ninth year of the 10th month and the 10th day of the month, he's going to be told to write this day, you know, write the, the name of the day, even this same day, the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem this same day, right? And so uh, this word, uh, same day this is a bone day right this is a, a self same day they could have translated it as so he's going to so this is a day or a date that is prophetically significant it's the 10th day of the month so jerusalem is going to be destroyed on the 10th day of the month in the fifth month not the 10th month so he's he wants him to know that it's the 10th day of the 10th month, but primarily it's the 10th day, right? That's what the bone day refers to. It refers to a date in a month, whether it's uh, just the date of the month, like the 10th of the month or the 15th of the month or whatever. That's what that self same day means or the bone day means, right? Okay, so he's he's mar he's been prophesying this siege of Jerusalem. Now, there's going to be some prophecies given to him here as well when this siege happens. He's going to be prophesied uh, that his wife is going to die, and she dies. And he's also given a prophecy regarding the escapee that's going to come. So are these things literally fulfilled in Ezekiel's time? Yes. Right. So, so Ezekiel is prophesying about events that are happening in his time, but are they typical? The prophets spoke more for our time than their time. Yeah. Um, right, but also we're, we're making an application of these things. We see history will be repeated, right? We don't take this and just directly take this prophecy and apply it to our time. We first have it fulfilled in the prophet's time in some way that it's fulfilled, and then we make an application of it. Now, a question was asked just in the chat about why is it told that uh, the temple is destroyed on the seventh day of the fifth month? And that's because it be, that, that has to do with, um, uh, because it's destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month. And that is in um, uh, in uh, the Second uh, Kings twenty five eight. So this is just an aside, but I, I, I should answer this question while it's asked. So this is going to be um, uh, the general of of Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to come and. This is describing this whole thing, the fall. So in the ninth year of the reign of the 10th month and the 10th day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, 
against Jerusalem and pitched against it. So this is going to give us that same date that we have in Ezekiel, right? Where he says, right this day, even this self same day, right? It's going to be the ninth year, the 10th month, the 10th day of the month. That's when the siege begins. And the city was besieged unto the 11th year of King Zedekiah on the ninth day of the fourth month, right? So we're going to have the, the walls of Jerusalem are going to come down on the ninth day of the fourth month. And the city was broken up and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which is by the king's garden. And then the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king. So, and this is talked about in Ezekiel. So uh, Zedekiah is going to flee. They overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all his army was scattered from him. And they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. And they took the king uh, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. Now he's going to be killed as well. But the thing is, he's going to have his sons killed in front of him and then his eyes put out. So the last thing he sees is his sons being killed. And then it says in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, uh, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, the servant of the King of Babylon into Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. Now, does it say he burnt it on the 10th day of the fifth month? Or on the seventh day of the fifth month, pardon me. So he gets there on the seventh day of the fifth month, but does it say he burnt the house of the Lord on the seventh day of the fifth month? No. No. So um, right, it just says that he came there. So on the tenth day of the fifth month, it's it, the other place is in Jeremiah. And it says, uh, now the fifth month in the 10th day of the month, which is the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, and served the king of Babylon in Jerusalem, and burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men burnt he with fire. So we have here, it says the 10th day of the fifth month. So the understanding is that he comes to Jerusalem on the seventh day of the fifth month, that the temple is not burnt until the 10th day of the fifth month. That, and that's just the simple explanation. But here, the emphasis is on the date that the temple is burnt, and the other one, the emphasis is upon when he comes to the city. So he's going to come to the city on the seventh day of the fifth month. But he's going to burn the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month. Does that satisfy? people's uh, questions regarding that because obviously the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So it's not a typo or, you know, somebody made a mistake. Okay. So hopefully that helps. So we're done here for today um, and for this week. So it won't be till Sunday till we come back to this again. So we still have this question before us and, and whether we can use Ezekiel, uh, as an example. And so we, we have Daniel, we have John. And so we need to figure how that's going to work. Now, Iran just noted 52 times 12. That's the, the verse equals 624 and 624 times 30 equals 18720. So just an interesting uh, point. Um, just uh, when we get to it, yeah. I'd like to sort of see how solid the application of the fiber fallen is with the pioneers understanding how it relates to republicanism, how they divide that up, how they understand mm -hmm. that five. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and they've done it different ways. 
how they've tried to understand the different forms of government. But yeah, we will look at that. So um, yeah, and, and so we're gonna be thorough in this, right? And that's why we're asking this question because the pioneers had this idea and we, we say, is this idea supported other places? And if we can't find it supported other places, then there's no reason to say, well, it must be that way in Revelation 17. So we, so we need to examine that point. And we might even be able to find other places in Revelation 18, or Re Revelation itself, where we could say, here is something that happens, he's brought into the future or whatever. But we, we need to examine that point. And also the pioneer's understanding of uh, Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Does it bear out? Did they make some error in how they interpreted that? Okay. Okay, so thanks everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study here this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit can be with those who watch the video. Help us, Lord, to seek you, uh, to know your presence and your peace. Um, we ask that you can be with us throughout this day. Give us guidance. Help us to be obedient to your voice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.